everybody. Welcome to Tuesday night on Narrative Live. So good to be with you tonight as we talk everything Ukraine, uh, here with our panel of brilliant Ukraine experts, uh, Michael McKay, who you've seen many times here on the show. How are you, Michael? How are you tonight? I'm well, Seth. Thank you. And Eric Garland, uh, intelligence analyst extraordinaire. How are you? Yeehaw! Yeehaw! It's been that kind of day. You have news about a Russian spy that has just had an indictment for uh, violating some FARA regulations. Just give us a brief headline there before we get into Ukraine, and then we'll come back to the story later on. But just, just tease everyone with what that story is about. Uh, a whole Russian spy operation busted for scoping out both New York and Hawaiian state politicians. Hmm. I like that. Interestingly enough, by the way, she's connected to a a spy ring that we reported on extensively last year about uh, the January the 6th uprising and uh, Mr. Bowsman, if I remember Charles Bowsman from Pennsylvania. So that's a big part of that uh, whole spy ring that uh, now it seems the spy has been indicted. So we'll talk about all of that in a little later on. But the big news tonight, of course, remains Ukraine with the situation. You know, it seems to be going from bad to worse. But on the other hand, there's some real... Uh, openings of a clear sky over your Kiev in, in literally opening up as the sun is now beginning to shine over Kiev, but also some real positive news coming out of the Biden administration. And also it appears Poland, but we'll discuss all of that in just a second. Let's start with you, Michael, because I know you've got your eye on what's going on in the ground there. Tell us how the situation is as you see it right now. Well, as you said, it seems dire, but if we look more closely, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that well, it's, uh, it's already tomorrow in Ukraine. Uh, it's day 13 since the offensive started, and it's nowhere close to the objectives that the Russians thought they would have on day two. So this is a remarkable victory. The only major city they've taken is Kherson in the south. They have not come anywhere close to besieging Kiev, and effectively, the blitzkrieg is no longer. And the Russians have resorted to a terror campaign of bombing and missile attacks. And particular hit uh, in this have been uh, Kharkiv in the east, uh, Sumy, and uh, Mariupol in the south. It's so interesting that you mentioned that because Kharkiv or Kharkiv is is a, was a still a very Russian speaking city. And, you know, these were the people that Vladimir Putin was coming to save. Uh, you know, he was claiming that they were the ones that were under the most uh, assault from, you know, Ukrainians speaking Ukrainians. And that, you know, he felt like they needed their his help. And yet that is the city which has received some of the most punishing um, attacks by Russia. And it's rock solid for Ukraine. Um, but this shows just how delusional Putin was about everything about Ukraine, and unfortunately, how too many people in the West bought into that, bought into the Russian-speaking regions of Ukraine, must mean somehow pro-Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. I was talking to someone over the weekend at a Stand for Ukraine rally, and I was saying this misunderstanding, it was like, let's, let's take someone in North America, who, or someone not from North America, mm -hmm. who would say, oh, um, People in Quebec speak French. They must be pro-France. Mm -hmm. And we look at them as if they were funny. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> that right. doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, and uh, or Spanish-speaking American is pro-Spain or Spanish empire. And you say that this is just confused thinking. Um, ethnicity, language, these are not the things that are determinants. And, you know, Ukrainians have always known this. The notion of a Russian-speaking Ukrainian nationalist is something I've noticed since I first uh, went to the country and started to experience it 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm not surprised that Kharkiv is standing. I'm a little bit surprised that it's still in Ukrainian hands when it's only like 20 kilometers away from the Russian border. That speaks to the incompetence of the uh, Russian offensive. And also the I mean, lack of moral authority. Speak a little oh, bit about complete lack of moral authority combined with military incompetence. Yeah, I mean, it seems you know it's not you know it's plainly obvious from the military people that have come uh, out from the Russian army, including the commander yesterday who did that plea on, on Ukrainian television, that there is no understanding amongst the rank and file. It seems of the Russian army that has been sent there that they are firstly were sent in to invade uh, Ukraine. I mean, they would not. 
They did not enter under those impressions. They thought they were liberating people. And in fact, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. That leaves them, you know, morally vacant. There's nothing there to allow them to proceed with their campaign. And it's contributing to an enormous problem for Putin on the ground, which is why you're seeing all these, you know, indiscriminate missile attacks um, on these cities carried out from far away. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's launching missiles from Belarus, which we have to realize is a uh, party to this conflict, you know, making this a multinational war. They've he's, chosen not uh, to send their troops in. Me. Is that is that true, though, that they've not sent their troops in? Uh, the Belarusians have not sent their The last in. I heard is that Putin wants it. Of course, Lukashenko being his puppet uh, wants it, but he's having serious trouble uh, getting his commanders to go along, and certainly the rank and file will not go along. The thing is, uh, Putin desperately needs them at this point. The troops that are massed in uh, the west of Belarus around Brest could open up a whole new front uh, you know, in the west of Ukraine, uh, regions like Volin, but they're sitting around in their barracks. And I think they're going to stay there. I think so too. Um, and that poses a huge problem. Yeah. I mean, look, two Putin. weeks in, we're looking at the first war in Europe in, in what, 80 years? There were almost, uh, someone said, uh, 200,000 Russian troops that were, you know, invading Ukraine. All of them seem to be restored. Yeah, the, yeah. the um, American military assessment was, you know, they were being cautious. They said 95% of all combat troops in Russia are now in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. you know, and so the main goals of, of Putin, which was, you know, ousting of the Zelensky government, the demilitarization of Ukraine, these are stated goals. Those are not happening. Clearly, those are not happening. And, you know, yeah. it's because of this incredible resistance of the Ukrainian citizenry, which has stood up a remarkable citizen's guard. I mean, they have been able to repel the incoming Russian forces, largely due to their own, you know, patriotism, their own determination and their own will, plus the incredible support of the world in terms of providing them arms of many sorts, billions and billions of dollars worth of arms, mostly organized by the United States, but from all the countries in the immediate vicinity, or especially in Europe, they've been able to, together, put up a pretty incredible resistance to Putin. It does not mean that there has not been incredible civilian casualties and incredible toll on the cities. I mean, you look at these videos of the uh, of these bombed out cities, and it's, it's horrific what... Um, Vladimir Putin is doing to these, you know, beautiful, old, incredible uh, Ukrainian cities. Yeah, I agree. It's incredible because we're not used to seeing it in Europe since the Second World War. But in a sense, it's not incredible if we contrast them with pictures of Aleppo and pictures of Grozny. And that speaks to what we're dealing with that in Putin, we have a regime of state terrorism. Yeah. Um, and that is something that we need to deal with on those terms. We can see that it is not the great power that we thought it was militarily in a conventional sense, because we see its failure of its conventional attack. But we see its true face, uh, which is a reflection of what it's been exactly like since Putin came to power, which was, uh, you know, he came to power with the Moscow bombings and by launching the Second Chechen War. Um, that is the nature of his regime. And I think it's important we look at it in that, that sense. And to say, and to in that way, say it's not actually incredible. It's not incredible if we would pay attention to what the enemy really is. Yeah, the incredible resistance I was talking about. I mean, the remarkable resistance. The incredible yeah, resistance, yeah, yeah. remarkable, inspiring. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Incredible in that sense, I agree. You know, and uh, led by Vladimir Zelensky, who's still in his office and still appearing, doing TV interviews, is quite something. It certainly is showing the world that he's not afraid of what might be coming because it doesn't seem to be coming. You know, at the end of the day, we're not seeing the siege of Kiev as we, as many had predicted. It doesn't look like that's going to. But, but about happen. that, you know, um, we're right to focus on that because that's certainly the most prominent. But he's not alone. Mm -hmm. All the other political leaders, except the pro-Russian ones who fled the country days ahead because they knew what was coming, mm. are still there. Mm. Famous Ukrainians, famous singers, famous actors, people are coming home to sign up for the ter uh, territorial uh, defense unit forces. You know, so it's across the board. Ordinary people, famous people, 
and the most visible is President Zelensky. Mm. Eric, jump in here because you are agreeing on Grozny and you're agreeing on uh, Aleppo. You know, just jump in with whatever your thoughts are right now, and then we'll, we'll we'll go back to some of the specifics around the MiG offered by the Polish. Well, I mean, the the Russians are, are better at committing uh, human rights atrocities than they are running logistics for military or anything else. So yeah, they know how to smash your um, your cultural artifacts. Uh, they know how to rape your women. They know how to destroy things, but they're not great. Apparently, they couldn't see their way to giving their soldiers uh, protein bars mm. and Gatorade or whatever. Nothing. So yeah, I mean, so they're doing you know what they do best. They're setting churches on fire. They're blowing up universities. You know, but that doesn't do great against Bayraktar drones or. Um, uh, you know, against the javelins. And by the way, I, I just saw some statistics about the hit rate of javelin missiles, which is what the GOP in 2016 changed their policy. So at the uh, uh, 2016 Cleveland Convention for the Republican National Convention to not give Ukraine javelins. That's a very if, good if point. The javelins. Thank you for raising yeah, that. It I is, forgot about it? that. Basically, just to remind everyone what this was, in 2016, the, you know, the Trump campaign under the uh, support of, with the support of the, of Putin, I suspect, uh, changed the, the, the platform of the Republican party to ban. Indirectly. Yeah. No, it's not, not, not Putin directly, just this guy, Paul Manafort, yeah. who happened to work for Yanukovych, yeah. who, uh, fled to Russia by that point and has been charged with treason since. So, yeah. you know, he made the natural, the natural career arc of <laughs> working for Putin's candidate in Ukraine to a uh, Republican uh, presidential uh, and, and chose candidate. to change the Ukrainian and, uh, platform, the, pla the platform around Ukraine. The, 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 the defense platform around Ukraine, while they were all at, I just learned this recently, a hotel owned by Russian mob boss Ihor Kolomoisky who has bought up <laughs> wide tracks of Cleveland and has since been indicted for the money laundering through Delaware and Florida to get up to Cleveland. And that just doesn't that add, that's the frosting on the birthday hot dog right there. Yeah, that's really that, interesting. Let's, let's, let's not digress know. too much, but that's interesting. So the javelins that the Republican Party, by the way, next time they tell you that Biden didn't do enough because they likely will, they're the ones who actually didn't want to give the javelins to the Ukrainians back in 2016. Noted. Thank you. Mr. Right. The Garland. javelin, the javelin hit rate is over ninety percent. Apparently, I saw it was like out of three hundred missiles fired, there's two hundred and eighty hits on Russian materiel. If that was a free throw average, the javelin would be in the NBA starting so, lineup. This is interesting. Celtics. The Russian air force has not been very present, and where they have been present in Ukraine, they've been shot down. It has not been very successful for them. So they're staying out oh, of the, the Russian. Air. Yeah, they're not going into Ukraine, and they're going not going into Ukraine because. Well, they've got the javelins, which Biden gave them, and they've got the Stingers, which is another sort of anti-aircraft. This is another over-the-shoulder anti-aircraft thing. I don't know how you fire this, but apparently that's more for your Zeb. That's more for your helicopters. They've uh, also got um, anti-aircraft batteries, but they they may also have um, you know something that is going to be under the radar, or literally, I guess, signals intelligence and other intelligence products that we might be slipping them as to when something takes off, how mm. fast it's going. So they may be getting some hints from right. NATO as to where to shoot. So the air uh, Ukrainian right. defense has been pretty good. Um, so we, have those, you know, those, we don't have those, to fire a missile to take down Russia's planes. I happen to see that there are a couple of, uh, of our, what are those big giant planes that, that survey the skies? What are they called? Uh, UACs. Ewax just hanging out in Romania for the last couple of days, which is interesting, given them probably visibility into Ukraine and where things might be in Ukraine. Well, they're, when they're hanging out there, they're <laughs> looking in at a great yeah. distance. So hey, they can hang out, not, they don't, you know, we don't have to be over Russia to look at Russia. We don't have to be over Ukraine to help no. protect Ukraine. So what happens when you have equipment that works? And just, just to be clear, those, those aircraft have been flying from bases in Sicily for the mm -hmm. past year. And they've been flying over uh, the territory of Ukraine. So they have incredible range and uh, mm -hmm. definitely uh, over the horizon uh, visibility. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, they definitely know about what's happening in the battle space. So we haven't, you know, there is a need, sure, for air cover and there is a need for an air shield, which is what uh, Zelensky has been asking for. Some have called it a no-fly zone. I think people are saying that that's just not feasible under this particular arena, but let's call it an air shield where they need fighter jets and they need some ways of shooting down 
missiles, planes, whatever it is they need. They've got a lot of that, as you point out, Eric and Michael. They've got these javelins, the stingers, and they've got visibility. That's very helpful when you've got the Russian army attacking you. But they did not have, up until now, enough of these fighter jets. And this is what Poland stepped into the mix today with. Now, um, this is the statement that came out from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from the Republic of Poland. It says the authorities of the Republic of Poland, after consultations between president and the government, are ready to deploy immediately and free of charge all their MiG-29 jets to the Ramstein Air Base, that's in Germany, and place them at the disposal of the government of the United States of America. At the same time, Poland requests the United States provides us with used aircraft with corresponding operational capabilities. Poland is ready to immediately establish the conditions of purchase of their planes. The Polish government also requests other NATO allies, owners of MiG-29 jets, to act in the same vein. So that seems like it was good news when it first came out. Because like, boy, look, the Polish are giving exactly what uh, we're talking about. And, the, and then, you know, the Americans should be happy about this. Only later this afternoon, it seems that the Pentagon was suggesting that this might not be the best idea. Is that right, Michael? You were having an update on that. Yeah, their spokesman, uh, Kirby, I think his name is, uh, made some statement saying, we have concerns. He didn't say what those were and that he thought the whole plan was untenable. That's what the word he used, untenable. So that's interesting. Why do you think that's happening? Why do you think, did Poland just throw something out of, out of the hat in order to move the criticism over to the United States that would be out of the line of fire if this happened? Or what do you think there's some other reasoning behind this? I think there was a lot of confusion about how this transfer was going to be made. A lot of what I consider to be bureaucracy and legal formalism about it, instead of doing what needed to be done. And I think some feelings were hurt about a uh, political effort to make this happen and speed it up Mm -hmm. that some people in the uh, less public uh, diplomatic and military circles didn't like. So they're pushing back against it. Interesting. Um, Do you think, considering all this other firepower, do we still believe that we need these fighter jets in the arena there? Or do we have enough already with these missiles, the stingers and the javelins? Absolutely. It is needed. It is required. Ukrainians have stated clearly that this is their weakness. They've been very open about this. What the Ukrainians say for simplicity's sake, is shelter the skies, will do the rest. Mm -hmm. And the means of doing that, that's getting down to the details. But I think we have to accept the principle is the right one. Shelter the skies means protecting Ukrainian families, the people on the home front, so that the soldiers who are at the battlefront have the comfort and security to face the enemy, Mm -hmm. because that's what's going to happen. The Russians are attacking. Ukrainians will defend. This terror bombing is going on. And this is the right thing for other Western countries to be doing to win this war. And to count on Ukraine's 25 to 30 MiGs that they had when the war started, and I'm not quite sure about losses, and Ukrainians are rightly being secretive about that. They still have a fighting force. To count on that as being the force in the air to stop this invasion of Europe is to be completely unreasonable. It is the right thing to do, not just the moral thing to do, it's the right thing to do to achieve our war goals, which have to be to defeat this invasion. So let's be clear though, when you say it's the right thing to do, are you saying that it's the right thing to do to send these Polish planes in, or do you think the right thing to do is for a no-fly zone to be set up? both. I think we should help the Ukrainian defenders in every way we can uh, with anti-air, with fighter jets of their own, and we should use our strength, which is the ability to command the skies, to do what has to be done. I strongly believe that it does not make a bit of difference if the fighter that shoots down a cruise missile and saves a city in Ukraine has a trident painted on its tail or a star painted on its tail. I don't think it makes any difference to the war, and I don't think it makes any difference. In fact, I know it doesn't make any difference to the Russian enemy. You know, I'm going to propose something here that I could be very wrong here, and I'll preface everything I'm about to say with the fact that I could be very wrong here. But my, I've been looking into 
why there is such resistance around, you know, this sending any, there being any contact between the Russians and, and NATO forces or American forces. And it seems to me that as part of that Budapest manifesto, which you brought to our attention so clearly in the last few weeks, the Russians have a different sort of take on that thing than the rest of the world seems to have, as they seem to have different takes on everything. But you know, Lavrov was quoted as when discussing this Budapest Manifesto, he said, ah, that just simply means no nuclear weapons from Russia attacking Ukraine. That's basically their understanding of why they won't use nukes in Ukraine. And so in, anytime you expand that conflict to something other than Ukraine versus Russia, it, say, it takes that no nukes card off the table, if you will. It also, in my opinion, is, explains why they're going after all these nuclear plants, because they can use them as dirty bombs without actually having to fire nuclear weapons at Ukraine. So I, I'm not sure if you, if you agree with that distinction. I think, you know, judging by our conversation before, before the show, you were not that keen on that interpretation. And I may be getting it wrong, but there could be, you know, in terms of understanding why, what sign or what flag is on the tail of a plane, that could be the reason why. Well, first of all, whatever Lavrov says should be discounted. Because if he says this today, he'll say something different tomorrow if it doesn't work out. It's not a position in the sense that it comes from any principle. So I'm just discounting that. Let's look at what the Budapest Memorandum really is. It's a document to assure Ukraine's security. That's in the title. It's mm -hmm. to assure Ukraine's security, its sovereignty within its territorial boundaries as they were when this agreement was signed in 1994 because Ukraine gave up all of its nuclear weapons. In other words, the whole point, which is to sustain the entire nuclear non-proliferation regime on which our modern world is supposedly based, was to give Ukraine the kind of military security, sovereignty, territorial integrity that it would have had if it had kept those nuclear weapons. Mm. And that is the only interpretation that someone can give to this Budapest memorandum. Treat Ukraine as if it had nuclear weapons and could defend itself with the threat of nuclear weapons and give it all the security assurance that we could in lieu of that. Um, regardless, you know, Michael, I think what you're saying is it's important that the world takes notice of this humanitarian disaster. What we're seeing in front of our eyes is unacceptable to everybody. You know, we shouldn't be seeing these cities erased from you know, the skylines erased in the way they have. We shouldn't be seeing stories of children being found dead because they've dehydrated. Uh, we shouldn't be seeing a video of citizens trying to flee back into Kiev as they were trying to escape the, the siege. They had to be forced back in and they had to, you know, as, as it was brilliantly shown to us by NBC, crossing this tiny little makeshift bridge to try and get back into the city of Kiev. We should not be seeing this kind of large scale humanitarian war crimes that are happening at the hands of Putin. But it is important also to remember that this is not America's fault. It's Putin who's doing this. And it's China who's standing by Putin and not doing anything about it. And it's America mm -hmm. with its you know, hands somewhat tied behind their back, which is providing everything it can to Ukraine in order to fight Putin's onslaught here. And I think that's important to remember. There's a lot of yeah. anger and upset at the Biden administration or the Americans, but it, you know, it's not their doing. It's Putin's doing. It's Putin's no, it's not, it's not what we're doing. It, it, is, it is the Russians who are doing this. Yeah. Absolutely. Primary responsibility, overwhelming responsibility lies with them. But you're saying that we should not be seeing it. And absolutely, we should not. And we should do something to make it stop. But also, we should have reasonably expected that it would happen because it's happened before. This idea you mentioned about uh, trying to take people across a rickety bridge, uh, well, the destroyed bridge. You're talking about the bridge at yeah. Irpin. Well, when I saw pictures about that, I reflect back to the bridge at Stanitsia Luhanska, which the Russians destroyed in 2014, and there were similar scenes then. Every time the Russians agree to a humanitarian corridor, they violate it. They turn it into a cauldron of death. They shell the civilians. They did this at Ilovaisk. They killed over 200 retreating Ukrainian soldiers after they broke the ceasefire. They did this at Debaltsevi um, when Ukrainians withdrew from that city. In the current phase of the war. They've do it, done it at Mariupol. That's the city where that child died today of dehydration along with her mother. They did it also at Sumy, a city in the Northeast. So in other words, there is no limits with this mm. enemy. 
There are no boundaries. There are no agreements. There's no treaties. There's no outrage that they are not capable of. And that's why I do get upset when people talk about what Lavrov says, Mm -hmm. because I know that from the beginning, it is meaningless. And I know that the only thing that is in our power at this time is how we can act, what we can do. And that makes me so strongly in favor of sheltering the skies, no fly zone. I really don't care what you call it. I just care about stopping the bombs and missiles and doing what needs to be done. Mm, 100%. Um, Let's look here at the map. I mean, we're looking at, and I'm showing this in particular because I'm going to lead to a point a little later on, but the the city you're talking about, Mariupol, is right there on the uh, the Sea of Azov, right by the part of the Black Sea that we're looking at there. A very important city, but it's also the one that's been under siege. There's an incredibly um, moving call by the local citizens there saying Mariupol urgently needs a green card or to evacuate residents and begs Europe to close the skies over Ukraine. Mariupol, day eight of resistance a few days ago, blockade for now in shorter cities, almost without communication, without light, heat, water. Heroic defense goes into state of blockade, a city on the verge of humanitarian catastrophe. Today, Russian fascists are creating a humanitarian catastrophe in Mariupol. These aggressors have found no other way to break us. They hinder the supply and recovery of electricity, water, and heat. They also damage the railway connection. Bridges were destroyed. Trains were smashed so that we would not be able to take women, children, and elderly people out of Mariupol. They hinder the supply of food, create a blockade for us, as in the former Leningrad. They deliberately destroyed critical infrastructure for seven days, life support of the city. We have no light, water, and heat again. Putin's horde troops are constantly shelling the city and preventing the removal of the wounded women and children. We are doing our best to restore the city's critical infrastructure as soon as possible. We are working with international institutions to create a green corridor for the humanitarian mission. We are working to ensure a quiet mode to restore power. At the same time, Mariupol remains under fire. Women, children, and the elderly are suffering. We're being destroyed as a nation. This is the genocide of the Ukrainian people. These hypocrites came to save Russian-speaking citizens of Mariupol and the region, and they arranged the extermination of Ukrainians, Mariupol of Russian, Ukrainian, Greek, and other origin. Many fakes are also distributed today. Therefore, I ask you, only the official sources of information, the mayor of Mariupol, Vadim Boychenko. Now we are still standing, but we need help urgently. It's terrible. Help close the sky. I mean, these, this is backed up by uh, independent accounts of what was going on. Maria Paul continues to go on to this day. And, you know, when there was an attempt to set up some sort of humanitarian corridor, the Russians' basically suggestion was that the citizens of Maria Paul retreat to Russia. Yeah, and straight into a concentration camp. Yeah. None of them will do this. Of course not. No, the corridor goes north. And let's not forget in this context, What the Ukrainian army is doing at the same time, they are fighting ferociously on the ground Mm -hmm. to keep the siege from being complete, to keep the corridor from the north open, to try to break the siege. They're doing everything they can with what they've got available. What they don't have available is the air cover. Additional air cover. I'm going to just go back to the map here because it is interesting that, you know, we've seen these areas that have all been highlighted in red in many other people's maps. And I've not added the red to the actual states here because even though the Russians seem to claim that they have large areas of Luhansk and Donetsk, and they also have the area around Mariupol and Kharkiv and Gerson, it's not true that they have all those areas. They have parts of those areas and it changes all the time. But the Ukrainian army is still very much resisting the onslaught of the Russians. And, you know, it's not that this is all just one swath of Russian ownership now. It's contested territory. There's a lot of back and forth between the Ukrainians and Russians here. And as you point out in Mariupol, it's still an area where there is, you know, resistance by the Ukrainians. They're not just giving into the siege. It continues to be a contested area. So, you know, Again, it speaks a lot to the morality and the, you know, the viability of the Russian army here. They don't want to be here. They don't want to be doing this fight. And the Ukrainians want them out as determinedly as possible. So you're seeing these two armies engage where even one might be stronger than the other on paper. The moral authority is with the Ukrainians. And that's forcing a lot of the 
Russians out of their positions. Because as we know, there's one thing, you know, attacking and occupying a city or besieging it. It's another thing staying there and running it and administering it and, you know, letting life continue over there. That's a very different thing. And Eric, maybe you want to comment about that a little bit, because it is a different scale of activity than just the, uh, you know, the initial occupation or attack. Well, you know, the thought that keeps coming to mind here is that America has been characterized with about 70 years of propaganda, largely from the KGB and its successor agencies about, you know, whenever Russia or the Soviet Union engaged in these kind of human rights abuses and its aggression towards the globe, America was characterized in one of two ways. If we intervened, we were called colonialists. We were called, you know, trying to be the world's policeman or whatnot. And then whenever something happened and we didn't intervene militarily, uh, or only diplomatically or economically, but not militarily, then it was just, well, this is America. You see, they're colonialists when they want, and then they don't care if people die. When that's in response mainly to Russia and Russian, you know, puppet states aggressions. So here we are, you know, talking about how do we deal with Russia? And I think, you know, for, you know, the territory being what it is, as much territory as Vladimir Putin is taking physically in Ukraine, behind him is ruins. They've just ceased trading the ruble today for six months. I didn't you see know, that. Really. That's these, interesting. All these, yep. Six months. They said uh, September. So you can't buy any foreign currencies. Well, that makes sense. You know, all the central bank reserves are being seized and all that. His economy is going to collapse. There is no way to finance too much more advance here. Um, you know, their oil and their gas is, gonna, is being sanctioned. So, you know, there's no question that the Russia is generally stronger than Ukraine. Although uh, clearly it's quite a contest once you give Ukraine, you know, intelligence, some air cover, weaponry, all that stuff, maybe some MiG-29s. But this is this whole thing is uh, going to be Putin's undoing. You know, it's so interesting. You point to the ruble only being now being put under six months of hold, but all the economic efforts of the United States and other countries to sanction Russia, those are only going to begin to bite right now. There's a lagging moment there. You know, he's a, some, so he'll have some reserves, Putin will, but it takes a minute before everything sort of, you know, turns through the system and Russia really gets hit by all these sanctions and all the limitations they have on their ability to do banking. Now, that is not to long. Hit. Within 48 hours, people have been saying, we're going to see the full effect of all these sanctions. So we've seen some of them, obviously, but he's going to really start feeling it in the next 48 hours. You've got to have a supply chain to have a war. You're going to have things that break. You're going to need to get, you know, you need to buy and sell petroleum. And, you know, that's wars turn on food and industrial lubricants and supply chains. That right. is how wars are won for the last, you know, ever <laughs> certainly... I mean, really, for the last 3,000 years, but, uh, you know, the modern warfare strategy has depended on logistics since the Civil War of the United States, which uh, the Germans and Russians uh, took great note of, by the way, when it was happening. And that supply chain is collapsing for Putin. And that is what we are doing rather than, you know, sending our Abrams A1 tank, you know, main battle tanks into St. Petersburg or something. We're just going to, you know, take all your real estate in New York and yeah. uh, shut you down from buying protein bars and also the, you know wars turn on bribes a lot of the time oftentimes not necessarily in ukraine but certainly the syrian experience was about bribing local leaders and it works you know you get warlords or whatever you bribe them it's sure. i don't think necessarily work in ukraine but it could work in ukraine but if you don't have the money if you don't have the supply if credit card isn't working anymore because visa and mastercard won't honor it um, maybe you can't pay off these guys as easily and so you've got a problem Plenty of those the local governments in the Ukraine are in the pocket of the Russian mafia. Let's mm. not forget that. And there's a bunch of names that never get mentioned in here, like, you know, Viktor Pinchuk or Ihor Kolomoisky. Dmitry Firtas has been getting... Pavel Fuchs, that's a great yeah. name. Yeah. You know, um, Rinat Akhmetov, you know, there's a whole lot of people. Or Semyon Magelovich, he's originally Ukrainian, right? Right. The, you know, Russia owned a lot of territory here in Ukraine in one way or the, the other. Well, it's, it's an interesting byproduct of what's happening with this military thing that they're doing is they're in some ways, you know, clearing out some of the folks that, well, if anybody left in Ukraine after all of this is still sympathetic to Russia, the way many of the, some of the, the local politicians were, I think they're going to get a very different reception after this. That's going to be quite a strategic reality that Russia faces is that, 
nobody wants to play with them anymore. Or at least anybody that used to be financially incentivized to cooperate with Russia or its intelligence services or its mob, they can't even get paid. They can't get Venmoed from these jerks. How's Rudy Giuliani going to get his payments from the Ukrainians now? I mean, that's a real question. <laughs> that's how he gets. A lot I have of a plan funding. to get him three hot meals a day and uh, <laughs> housing for the rest of his life. Uh, if I get it. So I want to discuss another thing here, which is going on. And we'll get to the spy in just a second. Look at the time. It's already 746. Maybe we'll get to all of this. I'm going to do my best here. We'll do this really quickly. So this is what he seems to be going after, our, our Vladimir Putin. He seems to be going after this little area that basically is the entire Ukrainian coastline, their access to the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. He seems to be determined to get this area for a number of reasons. One of them is because of... Uh, Nova Russia, which is a whole other conversation, which we'll have tomorrow. But the other reason, which I've you know pointed out many, many times on narrative, and this comes back to a blog that I wrote, a blog post I wrote in 2017 called Putin's Power Play, which basically theorized that what Putin was doing was what the Romanovs did and what every other major Russian leader has always tried to do, which is find warm water ports, because for the most part of its uh, year, it's a landlocked country and it's got frozen ice everywhere else. It really would love to get warm water ports because that way it could shift some of its trade routes and its trade expectations into the Mediterranean. Now you might say, well, well the Mediterranean is so far away. The Mediterranean is so far away. But if you look closely at what he's doing here, and this is another maybe difficult to read map, but you can sort of see this shaded area here under Ukraine, where under which is Moldova, the area in Ukraine that they're contesting right now. You can see that he just needs to bridge all these areas we just showed you in the previous map and Moldova, where he's also got this additional territory of uh, Transnistria, which is another territory that mm -hmm. Russia is contesting along sort of the western or southwestern coast, uh, sorry, west southwestern border of Ukraine. And we've noticed in the recent past that uh, Mr. Putin's information branch led by Konstantin Milofiev and the Russian Orthodox Church has been opening up a lot of interest into Bulgaria and into Greece. So the same things that they sort of have done previously to Crimea and to the United States with their disinformation efforts from the Malofiev camp, they are now beginning to do to Bulgaria and to Greece. So you start thinking, well, maybe this is what he's trying to do here. Maybe what Putin is after is a long shot, but still a shot, at trying to open up another warm water port through Greece into the Mediterranean which would uh, you know, achieve this incredible fantasy that the Russians always have, that they will one day be able to achieve such a thing, which you know, every turn of history has led them not to achieve that. What do you think about that, gentlemen? Is there something more to Putin's obsession here with this particular coastline than he is the obsession with Ukraine in general? Either of you. Maybe not. Either. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, this is just classic. Um, it's classic. Uh, Zev, they weren't just well, he'll, he'll the Odessa anywhere. coastline. He sees, he sees weakness. It's weakness, but I think it might have a strategy. Yeah, Go ahead, Eric. Oh, sure. Yeah. He needs, look, you know, Murmansk, Arkhangelsk, uh, pretty cold in the winter, as you pointed out. Yeah. They, you know, Odessa and Crimea have typically been very important to the Russian Empire, but they've gone as far as far south as Tarsus, Syria. They were establishing a permanent base when they were dissuaded from doing so finally. And they motored the Admiral Kuznetsov, their one aircraft carrier home, where it promptly was attacked viciously by a dry dock that took it out of service. But they didn't just want the Black Sea. They wanted the Mediterranean, too. This I is Russia. So. They want as much territory as they can get. Well, I think that this idea reflects a strategic thinking that I don't think Putin has. He's a KGB agent. He's a sabotage and disruption man. He looks for weakness in enemies to exploit. He looks for chaos, and he can't see beyond that. He's entirely relativistic, situational. He will seize any opportunity of the moment. He has no awareness of consequences. And that is why, among other things, we need to confront and defeat him now in Ukraine. This is our best opportunity. And the Ukrainian people have given it to us. That's, yeah, there's that's no doubt that this that would be you know this would disrupt his plan. If this was a strategy to try and do everything, the thing which I'm pointing to specifically is, you know, if his goal is to take over this coastline, if that really is what he'd like to end up with at the end of this war, that that needs to be resisted at all costs. You know, we've been 
there's maybe a suggestion at the start of this, well, well, you know, Luhansk and Donetsk, he's, there's some Russian population there that one could see their way for him to have pieces of those areas. But if his real goal is to establish this Novo Russia, this sort of larger Russian thing that expands all the way from, you know, across the, this coastline that we're talking across, which is the Russian, which is the Ukrainian coastline. Now we're talking about something that we need to resist at all costs on a very, you know, open and international basis. There should be no concessions here at all, as I'm sure he'll try and say that these are, you know, Russian influenced areas and these are areas that he now has in his, you know, control or possession or occupation, that we should be resisting that at all costs. There can be no give here to Russia in any way. Any of this attempt to capture any of the Ukrainian coastline needs to be completely thwarted but, but, but and that's, rejected. That's by always everyone. been true from the beginning. Mm. It's when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, they said Crimea is ours. Mm. But their propaganda doesn't limit itself to that. At the same time, they say Crimea is ours. Why? Oh, it's historically Russian land. They said Alaska is ours. Mm -hmm. and they, oh, why? Because it's historically Russian land. Everywhere there are Russians, there is the Russian world, Ruski Mir. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say there is no limit to where this aggression can go. The only limit is where it is stopped. That is the only limit to his uh -huh. ambition. And I'm yep. saying that this war in Ukraine, a war against the entire West, all of Western civilization, now being fought most intensely in, in Ukraine, is the main opportunity to defeat the Moscow Empire. It's an opportunity that Ukrainians have given us. And for us not to take this opportunity, to not to join them on the battlefront where they've been alone for the past eight years, is to me unconscionable. But you're suggesting, just to make sure that I understand you correctly, you want to see American troops in Ukraine fighting Russia right no. now? What Why? do you mean by joining us in the battlefield? They don't need them. Then what about joining Ukrainians them on the battlefield? Said, what do you mean? Don't by need that? troops. Don't do mean... send troops. Okay. Shelter so what... the skies. You want to shelter the sky with American pilots? With whatever it takes to defeat the air power of Russia over Ukraine, because that's the one area where Ukraine is weak. You're just talking about air superiority. It's a very common concept, own the skies. And, you know, and if we're backing up a, an ally and we want to help them achieve air superiority so that their enemy can't have it. Whoever has air superior, right. superiority and has a major tactical advantage, and that can be done a lot of ways. Which includes these, tw and these 29 megs from, from Poland, if that's what's necessary. That may be a way to do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that our discussion about NATO versus non-NATO and direct confrontation versus indirect support does not make a lot of sense. It is not meaningful. It actually it takes away from our war effort. It actually gives Russia a narrative opportunity to say, look, see, NATO isn't a defensive alliance because the, the whole notion where they've been lying about how, well, America promised it wouldn't expand NATO. First, it's not ours to expand. Second of all, nobody said that. Nobody said, oh, well, we, you know, we, we want to leave you a bunch of puppets, you know, a bunch of satellite states that you can easily invade in case you just want to commit some, you know, uh, atrocities, Russia. Nobody said that to Russia. Not, so, you know, since 1945, 46, we're pretty sure Russia gets up to some bad stuff. Nobody promised them victims. So NATO's a defensive alliance. But if you get in the business of taking that defensive alliance, and launching attacks based on it, then Putin and Lavrov and these other jerkwads have got space to say, see, we told you, and then thus we have the right to our territorial integrity. So, you know, but you limit, didn't do that, limit the narrative space. Else. That's great. Uh, you're frozen in a, in a great uh, position, Eric. I don't know if you can see where you're frozen, but uh, you are frozen. You're pointing your finger and you're, you're <laughs> uh, I love that. I, wanna, oh, I was going to grab a still of that. Did you see where you landed up, Eric? <laughs> you're pointing your finger in the air and you're all you're angry. Not angry. You're, putting, you're making a point, as you were. I want to talk about the Russian spy. Can we talk about the Russian spy? Because it's so interesting. Sure. Let's talk about the Russian spy. We, we're going to wrap up on Ukraine a little bit. But let's talk about, uh, you, you know more about her than I do, although I do have some interesting information about her that you might find interesting as we describe who she is. She is Elena Branson, a U.S.-Russia citizen. She's been charged with illegally acting as a Russian government agent. Tell us more, mm -hmm. Eric. 
18 U.S. Code 951, which is uh, not just a FARA charge uh, for, you know, you've been doing advertising and public relations I- illegally. That's your uh, spy for that government and you're running other spies. And that's what the op ghost stories uh, Russian illegals got hit with in 2010 um, was 18 U.S. Code 951, a felony for failing to register with the Department of Justice while acting as a spy on U.S. soil. Ms. Branson, I forget her actual Russian name there, was running a Russian cultural center in New York, and it turns out they were running human intelligence operations against the mayor's office, against New York politicians, the oh, no. you know senators, you know, uh, Hawaiian. There was a... in. In the indictment, and remember, just because something's an indictment or in the DOJ press release doesn't mean that's the only thing these people were up to. That's just what we decided, uh, you know, they could fit into the, you know, that's enough, you know, to justify the indictment and what we're going to say for now. But there was also a deal with some Hawaiian local politicians. And it's very interesting between the Chinese, the Russians, the Israelis, and other folks rolling around America, the notion that somehow like town, you know, city councils or regional municipal governments aren't tasty targets for um, foreign spies is just naive. It's all good. You know, any chink in the armor is great. So uh, today the FBI and the Department of Justice came out and announced charges against Atlanta Branson. They shut down uh, her operation in New York in November. And I I thought it was hilarious at the time. And I now think it's really hilarious because she was blaming FBI action for (laughs) <laughs> taking down the Russian center of New York. It's like, yes, that's what Russian count. That's what FBI counterintelligence does is they think you're running a spy center I out remember. of uh, New York. Uh, that, the FBI counterintelligence, they're going to get on you. They were I all mean, complaining. Like, the FBI was asking. Taxes. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, you know, so here I am cheating on my taxes and the IRS comes and starts <laughs> messing with me, you know? And then here I am, you know, selling explosives to my neighbors so they can maybe blow up some post office and the ATF gets up in my grill like, hey guys, back off, what's yeah. the deal? It's your like, fault that my organization's yes. going down. For God's sakes, don't do that. <laughs> the <Unbelievable>. FBI. <laughs> now, you know, it's interesting and that so- the... Uh, Go ahead, finish, finish that thought, and then I'll jump in. Oh, uh, well, and then who does she go to complain to? She goes on Russia Today and talks to Maria Butina, everybody's <laughs> favorite NRA activist and GOP fangirl. Um, it was like, who who got hit with a 951 charge? And I still like to know why she got sent home to be a propagandist and join the Duma. But that's who she goes to complain to. It's, Can you believe it? that they, I, they call me a spy here. Can you believe it, Maria? Well, yes, we can. <laughs> we can. It's interesting. It says here, in addition to the RCNY, Branson served as a chairperson for the Russian Community Council of the USA, KSource, which may not be that familiar to some That's people. Cyrillic. Yes, but it is, it is familiar to us because it's related to the Bowsman inquiry. But I love this part. It's funded at least in part by various Russian government-run entities, among other things. KSource coordinated an I Love Russia campaign in the United States and organized youth forums focused on the promotion of Russian history and culture and American youth. KSource. Now, I Love Russia. Isn't that a great idea? I Love Russia campaign. I think it was around 2016 mm-hmm. they did that campaign. Yeah. Now, oh, uh, yeah. there is a connection I mentioned to the Bowsman's investigation we did. You remember that this, this group of people, Konstantin Malofiev's in crowd there included Charles Bowsman, who's the propagandist, I would say, uh, out of Pennsylvania. Then this is Edward Lazansky, which you may be familiar with uh, in all your work, Eric, because Ed Lazansky is a, runs a fictional university called the American University of Russia, or something like that. And he is also related to KSource. He's also a member of the KSource board. And it's interesting that Lazansky is very close to Charles Bowsman. He's also very close to Alexander Dugan, who's sort of the theorist that Putin has out there about how the world's going to change. And uh, they're all close to Konstantin Malofiev, uh, who we've mentioned before tonight. Who was behind the the Crimea invasion, who was sanctioned, and Jack Hannock just caught charges for working for Malofiev against uh, uh, the Emergency Powers Act uh, and the sanctions that were against him. Sean Hannity's former producer at Fox News, because that's just how they roll. So... (laughs) Just to say that there is a lot of interesting activity going on right now, as the US DOJ seems to be taking down now a Russian agent just today. They indicted uh, Hannock the other day for violating sanctions related to the funding of these organizations in breakaway Ukraine that Malofiev has been doing. So it's not just- can I, this- can I take a victory lap here? Yeah, take a victory lap. Yeah. So, you know, I'm old enough to have been, you know, come out like just after the 2016 election and said, hey, you know, there's kind of some Russia in here. And it's boom! 
that's a, it's a, an unhinged conspiracy theory. And now it's like, oh, you've got them in New York and they're hitting the mayor's office and you got Fox News guys and you got, you know, you have Democratic lobbyists who were working for Yanukovych too. It's like Russia. Have you met them? They do spy things. They do human rights violations. They do mob stuff. It's Russia. And, you know, just as somebody who got yelled at a lot for how crazy that was, it's like, we sure do have a lot of federal indictments for people acting for the Russian spy services, yeah, which apparently are quite active so there's many people who are saying that you know russia the russia thing is overblown that the it's still a hoax and it was never proven i mean you just can't say that anymore you cannot say that anymore there's just too much red ink everywhere that says russia did everything since 2016 onwards i'm not saying they didn't do it in concert with other people but insufficient been, blowing it yeah. has not been blown enough <laughs> well done for blowing it there i was called a nazi today for running more conspiracy theories uh so i was felt like i was in good company there with other well-known nazis like vladimir Zelensky, i guess so <laughs> just because they, they twitter can't give up all right so that's interesting and good news honestly this is incredible that the doj is doing a lot of this really important enforcement of what's led up to 2016 and led up to you know people forget there's a continuum here you know 2010 in ukraine the um remind me again 2010 was, was it the maidan revolution or was it the dignity revolution I should know better 2010 was uh yanukovych versus uh timoshenko election right. so right. that's right. when uh Manafort brought his man home. Right. So 2010 into, uh, the presidency. is the equivalent of 2016 in America. So 2010 Ukraine is actually what happened in 2016 when we got Donald Trump elected. And Yanukovych is Donald Trump. And then you fast forward to four years and then you've got the revolution, right? You got the, is that the Maidan revolution? And that's when Yanukovych, mm -hmm. you know, fled to Russia with a lot of money, tons of money from the Ukrainian treasury. And that puts us basically to 2020 and in equivalent years in the United States. At the same time, we've had the same machine operating. We've had the Manafort, Milofiev machine operating in our countries, uh, dividing us in Ukraine. It was the division between Russia and Russian and Ukrainian speakers in the United States. It was, you know, MAGA versus the, the libs, you know, with the vaccine and everything else thrown in there. But that machine has been dividing us in the same way that Ukraine has been divided. And fast forward to, you know, this incredibly vicious attack by Moscow having got on the ground ready for this attack through their uh, Crimea attacks in 2014 and also the parts of the eastern Ukraine, which signals to me that, you know, the reason this is, is so important that we're doing all these takedowns of Russian assets and indictments of Russian people is that Putin's got a plan and some people might think he doesn't and it might look a lot like Ukraine is today. He might think he can do that to the United States going forward. As you point out, Alaska is under contention amongst other things. It's really important that we stay focused on Russia. It's really important that we stay focused on Putin and that we take down every part of this machine that has attacked the world. But certainly that there is continuity between the Ukraine story and the American story is undoubtedly true. What did you say, Michael? Because Russia prototypes every attack on the United States in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You want to look at, talk about election interference and taking an impossible candidate and making him viable, look at 2004 and what it led up to the Orange Revolution. That was their first unsuccessful attempt to bring Yanukovych to power. You mm -hmm. want to look at cyber attacks, look at Ukraine, attacks on the power grid that were then deployed against the United States. You look at elite capture of the Republican Party. Well, that occurred in the party of regions in Ukraine seven, eight years previous to that. And if you look at Russia's invasion of Ukraine that started in 2014, you see the imperialism that was going to be coming the United States and everyone else's way inevitably. You look at this offensive that's happening right now, which is in some ways like World War II all over again, and in other ways a repeat of terror attacks on Chechnya and Syria, and you see what is coming everyone's way. It all starts in Ukraine. Absolutely. We are all Ukraine and they are all Americans and we're all part of the same free world, you know, that uh, we're all trying to defend. And there's really, uh, we should be defending them with every piece of uh, weaponry we have and every piece of, of available resources that we have, including sanctions and, and whatever else we might be able to throw at this because, uh, you know, whatever happens in Ukraine today might happen in the United States tomorrow. We are out of time. I had intended to run a pretty lengthy interview with uh, someone in uh, Ukraine that I did yesterday. Now, as it turns out, events overtook some of that interview, but it's still a great interview. And I'm gonna run some of that tomorrow. 
And hopefully we don't have any more events happening in the next 24 hours that are overtake the story even more, but it's quite possible we do because also tomorrow we want to bring in another huge element into this, which is Nova Russia and understanding exactly what that was and how it links back to the Romanovs. And you'll be glad to hear, Eric, because I know how much you love them. There's a king in the picture, a Russian king coming back. We're making oh, coming in. There's a new monarch in Russia. There's a new monarch in the wings waiting in, in Russia. That's, uh, well, that's if, if you're going to do Nova Russia, Zev, you've got to come up with that flag. You know, that Confederate flag looking thing. So be sure you have that as a graphic. You know what? I have it because I know because I pulled it out earlier on and I was going to throw it in the show today and I just thought we got so full. But yeah, I'm just just to tease everybody because it is fun to tease everybody. If I can find it here quickly, oh, I can't. Anyway, there is a flag. There's a Russian Tsar. The Romanovs are returning. Yeah, look it up. What are, they are after this part of Ukraine. They're maybe even after the world. And it may explain everything. We'll discuss all of that tomorrow on the show. I think I've invited both of you gentlemen to be on the show tomorrow, but I don't know if you can. Hopefully you can. You'll let me know afterwards if, if you can. If you can't, we'll, we'll make plans. Uh, but thank you very much for being here tonight. Also, a very big thank you to everyone on Patreon who's been supporting narrative. You know, There's been a lot of talk around narrative and a lot of people detracting from the work that we do here. But a lot of you have stood by narrative and many more are now contributing to Patreon. I want to thank everybody who's doing that because it means the world to me. And it also means that we can continue to do this work, which is so important. So if you want to help us uh, continue to do this kind of work, please go to patreon.com forward slash narrative and contribute to the show. And on that note, I will leave everyone uh, with a very good night. Michael, just remind everyone how they can find you. On Twitter at MHMCK. MHMCK, I've learned that off my heart by now. And Eric Garland can be found at Eric Garland, but you also want to tell people about anything else, you feel free to, Eric, because I know there's some news in your world. There's no news. Oh, I thought you okay. There's no news. But there was a podcast. You see my name. You see, you got, well, yeah, the podcast is back, but where you see my name, you can Google it and find some stuff. All right. Both feeds are must follow feeds if you're interested in what's going on in Ukraine. And uh, we will be back tomorrow on Narrative Live. Thank you very much for being here tonight and have a good night, everybody. Narrative is made possible by viewers like you. Join today and support truly independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative. That's patreon.com forward slash narrative.